Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for every day. Uh, we appreciate uh, the way that you, you created us, uh, how we are knit together just perfectly. Uh, couldn't have happened about in some way of, some way of chance over millions of years. Uh, we ask that you be with us this evening, uh, be with me as I speak here, and that uh, you would help us understand your will for us uh, from this day forward. Amen. Well, um, a little bit on testimony with regard to where I come from. I grew up in the church, but um, I was always an analytical thinker. Uh, I loved science and math, and I did well in those subjects throughout school. And whenever I would ask questions of the pastors uh, that were uh, without answers, uh, normally the answer would be something like, Oh, J.D., don't worry about that. Uh, just trust in Jesus. Well, uh, I could not see how if the Bible was wrong in the first part, the foundational part of the Bible, how it, if it was incorrect, which it obviously was, because uh, we all know, we, I knew for sure, I'd been taught in school, every class I went to told me that uh, the earth was millions of years old and dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago and uh, we all got here by evolution. And so um, I... I uh, was involved in the church. The only time I dropped out of the church totally was when I went to university. Uh, but then when I got married and we had kids and we went back and uh, got involved in the church again. But that was because we had this feeling that, well, that's where the good people are and you want to have uh, bring up your kids in, a, in an environment where they're good people, right? So uh, it wasn't until I was 40 years old that I accepted Christ. And the reason I accepted Christ was because, to tell the story, it goes like this. I, uh, I was uh, uh, the leader, one of the leaders in the church, and I was in a Genesis study, a Genesis Bible study, along with the pastor and, and many of the other uh, people in the church. And uh, the, in this Genesis Bible study, I whacked eloquently about how Genesis chapters 1 through 11 were uh, allegory, and no one said anything. And then, uh, so, you know, I was pretty proud of myself. And I walked out to the parking lot, and uh, one of the guys there who was listening, who was in the Bible study, named Jim, he walked up to me. He said, J.D., I don't have all the education you have. I, I just pound nails. I'm just a construction worker. But would you do something for me? And I said, sure, what's that? He said, would you listen to this audio tape on creation science? And I did. And that was the first time I had ever heard that there could be any answers that would be biblical. And so that was, that was uh, 30 years ago. And uh, not long after that, I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, and my entire life changed. Uh, you know, I was lost, and then I was found, and the scales fell off my eyes, and all those uh, things that you hear about. And so uh, that, that's why I uh, like to speak to, to people. Uh, many of whom may be in the same boat or have ch people they know that are in, the, in that, have been in that situation. So I'm here tonight uh, to provide you with some information about the subject of biblical paleontology. And uh, I assume that's what most people do when they come here, so to provide you with information. But I'm also here to encourage you that a knowledge of biblical paleontology is a powerful deterrent for the secular worldview that bombards each and every one of us on a daily basis. I am uh, aimed to influence you tonight, uh, especially if you're confused by this onslaught uh, from, uh, from all of the secularism around, that uh, with your own self-developed knowledge of biblical paleontology, uh, that it could serve you well in this battle of worldviews that we all are involved in. Uh, a little bit about my ministry, especially as I said, uh, I've been at this uh, uh, for 30 years, but I didn't. Act, I, I mostly fumed for 20. Uh, you know, just uh, sat around, just being upset by the situation that uh, not only the world didn't agree with my newfound uh, perspective, but many in the church didn't agree with it either. So. Uh, it wasn't until 2004 that I that I founded the my Creation Engineering Concepts Ministry, and then in 2005 I founded the Institute for Creation Science down in Portland area as well. 
So I've been researching, uh, writing, speaking, and promoting within this creation science field for, for over a decade uh, with an emphasis on biblical paleontology. Um, so what you see that I've been doing here on this slide, it says I've been doing research in creation science, writing about creation science, speaking about creation science, and also promoting creation science. And so creation science is a big field. You know, that science is uh, uh, what the word means is knowledge. And so if you're going to look into this, uh, this general revelation that God has provided us, the creation, there's a lot to look at there. Uh, and I was, have been, I've always been interested in uh, paleontology. So that's uh, what I have uh, chosen as my specialty. So what is biblical paleontology exactly? Well, it's, uh, biblical paleontology is the study of paleontology strictly applying biblical presuppositions. Whereas, and paleontology is the study of plant and animal life from the past, including fossils that are found in the rock record. In paleontology, as with every field of study, presuppositions are paramount for determining our interpretations of the world around us. And here are some presuppositions for biblical paleontology. In the beginning, God created everything. The Bible is God's true word to mankind. Three, God created in six ordinary days, only thousands of years ago, and life was created according to kinds. And fourth, a worldwide flood destroyed all land, animals, and humans, except for those on Noah's Ark some 4,500 years ago. Now, the secular world uses a different set of presuppositions in uh, the, the study of paleontology, like the, those on this slide. They uh, presuppose that there is no God, or if there is a God, he's irrelevant. They presuppose everything came from nothing, all life forms evolved from common ancestors over billions of years, and homology, which is the study of similar characteristics in life forms, that alone proves the evolution of all extinct and living life forms. Note that these presuppositions are diametrically opposite to the biblical presuppositions. Now, I, I do this uh, ministry that I do, even though I've found the following. I found that the topic of origins is seemingly unimportant to most people, and many Christians resist creation science in their churches. A majority of Christians believe Genesis 1 through 11 are allegory or myth, and nearly all public and many Christian institutions promote secular science and work to negate creation science. Well, I continue to enthusiastically uh, pursue this ministry because I know truth is paramount. Uh, John 14.6, I'm sure you all know that. And I always want to be ready to defend my hope in Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 3.15. And I know that I am to contend for the faith. And also because it is my evangelistic mission, you know, to make disciples as commanded by our Savior. Let's look at some specifics. Now, many non-Christians and even those who consider themselves to be Christians have rejected the Creator God, as explained in Romans 1, verses 18 to 32. And God has given them over to the sinful actions, desires, and depraved minds that have become so widespread in our culture today. And I think all of you can probably understand what I mean regarding the moral freefall we've been experiencing in America, especially for the during my lifetime. What carries this rejection of the Creator along? Well, the philosophy, or some people call it a religion, of evolution and deep time or millions of years, that was founded and developed as a part of an attempt to destroy the Christian worldview. And specifically, the promotion of the atheistic interpretation of the fossils in the rock record and the advancement of the geologic timeline as a scientific fact. Now, thus the primary reasons for my emphasis on biblical paleontology. These philosophical ideas of evolution and deep time are what I've witnessed are the primary weapons of the enemy in our worldview battle. Organic evolution and deep time are two sides of the same coin and are the main weapons Satan has used and is using in his attempt to make Christianity irrelevant in the culture today. So imagine Satan holding a coin 
with evolution on one side and deep time on the other. That is, that's what he is doing, and he's running throughout the earth today, giving this to the people and telling them that it's reality. Now, hopefully, when I get through this talk, you'll have a better understanding. But you really need to understand that evolution can't stand without deep time. Deep time can't stand without evolution. They, need, they each need each other. Now, this slide uh, presents good evidence for the fundamental importance of uh, promoting biblical paleontology against the secular atheistic paleontology, and also against the uh, closely related belief called theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is a Christian philosophy that accepts atheistic evolution and rationalizes it, that God is somehow involved in the process. And in my studies, I've, I've come to the conclusion that there's really no difference, uh, very little difference between theistic evolution and atheistic evolution, except for that one thing. Oh, God must have been involved. So let's retrace these steps of rejection of the Creator that uh, so many have taken. Number one, if you believe the fossils from the rock record show evolution in millions of years, then the second logical thing is, therefore, the Bible's wrong about origins issues. And number three, if the Bible is foundationally wrong, it must be wrong about other things, or at least it could be. And number four, if the Bible is errant, it can be rejected concerning absolutes of right and wrong. And if there are no absolutes, even the Creator can be rejected. Here are the main component fields of study within biblical paleontology. We have the fossils, the actual fossils themselves, and we have radiometric dating and deep time. The anatomical similarities that we find, uh, that's the studies of homology and morphology. And then it's important to also study the history of paleontology. And I contend that the layman can, with a little effort, become knowledgeable about these fields to the point that he or she can know scientifically that naturalistic evolution is a false philosophy. I submit that these fields of study are all accessible to anyone with a desire to know the truth. If biblical paleontology triumphs in this study, then the secular worldview will totally fade away and the biblical worldview will shine through in every aspect. But Christians have another problem, and that is that most of the Christian universities and seminaries in America today accept atheistic philosophy regarding origins. These theologians are not willing to take the time to discover on their own that the truth is not that which is promoted by secularists on the issue of evolution and deep time. What we have in this uh, slide here is an Answers in Genesis slide that's been around for a while. And uh, so the, uh, the scientist is showing the rock layers and he's saying, the Bible is not true. These rock layers show that the earth is millions of years old. You have to believe me since I'm a scientist. And unfortunately, so many theologians uh, I think you might be shocked to find out how many th theologians are not willing to take the time to look into this on their own, but they just say, oh, well, if you say so, Mr. Scientist, it must be true. I'll have to accept the millions of years and try to jam it into the Bible some way. Now, we also have, um, when, when we're looking at that, um, that situation is tragic enough, what we've got there. Um, and we can look at a little deeper, too, when we look at the Scripture. In Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, we read, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. These teachers have no excuse for this. Paul warns us that every Christian, he warns every Christian about this. And in Colossians, he, uh, Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. And there is no more hollow or deceptive a philosophy than evolution and deep time. Now, if you would like to um, know a little bit more about this current takeover of our Christian universities and seminaries by secularists, 
I recommend the feature articles in the November 29, 2014 issue of World Magazine. That's the cover of it there. Fairly recent, just uh, came out uh, last of last month. And uh, that issue is not the only place where we can learn about what's going on and about the tremendous amount of money that's being poured from secular institutions, from secular ideas into our uh, seminaries and universities. Uh, and what, it, what you're finding is, is these, pla these places are bowing down to money. You know, it's, times are tough. It's hard to do all the things you'd like to. And so, oh, you'll give me $200,000 to allow you to bring in your scientists to talk to our seminary students? Oh, sure, you know. Well, uh, what we need to do is that we need to be aware that this is going on and that it's, uh, it's really a tragic situation. Uh, I can give you an example, Multnomah University's uh, seminary, which is in Portland, just recently accepted a $200,000 grant to allow the American Association for the Advancement of Science to come in and teach uh, their seminary students a bunch of science. Now, uh, what you have to realize is that there isn't going to be any way that those students can have uh, uh, a chance against these people, because how many seminary students have a background already in uh, university chemistry or physics or biology? Uh, that's not an important thing for them, right? So now what's going to happen is these, these atheists are come rushing in there, and they're going to be learning all this stuff, and the next thing you know is that they'll be theistic evolutionists. We, we, so whenever you see... Um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science in your, paper, in your newspapers, uh, you know, your Christian newspapers, or if you see Biologos, B-I-O-L-O-G-O-S, Biologos, or the Templeton Foundation, these people are in, are, uh, in, a, in a, a real battle to try to uh, change all of our seminaries over to this theistic evolution. Well, next we can look at some things Christians can do to try to counter this rush to secularism in the church. So... Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to, I'm going to give you uh, what I would call a plan for an individual, any individual here or any individual that's a uh, believer in Christ as to how he can or she on their own can come to the same conclusion I did uh, to know for sure, without a doubt, that we can believe God's word from the very first verse to the very last verse. Uh, this book, The Creation Dialogues, um, is a book that I wrote uh, originally in 2010, and then a second edition came out in 2014. And the, the reason this, this was my first book, and the reason I wrote this book was that I was asked to speak at a Christian university, and uh, they had an origins class. And I thought, oh, well, that ought to be fun. I'll go to a Christian university and talk about origins, right? And then I found out that the class textbook was a book called The Evolution Dialogues. The Evolution Dialogues. And it was written by the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Center for Science Education, um, which their whole concept was that Christians can accept uh, evolution of millions of years into their faith, and not only can they, that they absolutely should. Um, of course, if you follow the logic there, uh, what happens is, is that if, if the students do that, then they, they end up throwing the Bible out. The Bible becomes irrelevant to them. So I wrote this book, The Creation Dialogues, as a response to their book, The Evolution Dialogues. And it's uh, pretty much just a general uh, apologetics book to explain uh, on the layman's level, at, well, actually at the same level of the Evolution Dialogues, to answer each point that they brought up as to uh, the the reason that Christians should not, you know, my my book is exact opposite on every point. They should not accept evolution in millions of years. Then uh, some years later, I wrote this book, discovering the animals of ancient Oregon, and uh, we'll be talking more about that one. It's it's a uh, whereas there are hundreds, I'd say there are hundreds of creation science books now. 
You know, until 19, in the early 1960s, there wasn't very much until Morris and Whitcomb wrote their Genesis Flood. And then sort of since that time, there's been acceleration. And now, you know, we have these book tables back here with a lot of materials. Um, but what you'll find is, is that um, they're pretty general. Uh, and the discovering the animals of ancient Oregon is different in that it is uh, a focus. It's a focus on a specific location. In other words, a lot of this, when you look at the surface of the earth and all the thousands and thousands of square miles, uh, it's easy to say in a broad stroke, for example, well, I see here that this is a result of some sort of a, uh, of a hydraulic action during the worldwide flood or that these fossils over here is a result of such and such a, a, an activity. But it's, uh, it's more difficult to go to a specific area and, and write a book. And so that's what this book, how this book is different. It's focused and it's not a broad stroke. It's a, a specific treatment of the John Day fossil beds. And it's biblically based. And, uh, on, and it's, it's uh, presupposed the creation and the worldwide flood. I also um, have the guidebook to North American Dinosaurs. This is the first book that any creationist has written with, where there's been an attempt to determine what the created kinds of dinosaurs were uh, when God created the dinosaurs. Uh, the reason that it's... Uh, limited to North America is because I could not, I, didn't, I could not, or should I better say, did not want to travel the whole world. So I, I only studied north of Canada, uh, you know, Canada and, and America, and, and uh, so that's why it's restricted. But I think that you would find, if somebody were to travel the whole world, that they wouldn't come up with uh, much different. And again, we're presupposing creation and the worldwide flood, just like the other uh, books. Now, this book is called Rocks Aren't Clocks, a critique of the geologic time scale. And um, well, again, lots of books have been written about uh, this geologic time scale. But I would say this is the first one that I think gets it right. I highly recommend this book. and. Uh, here again, his presuppositions, uh, John K. Reed, he, he's a professional geologist, and so he knows what he's talking about. But uh, when you get done with reading Rocks Aren't Clocks, you'll understand what I mean when I say that the geologic time scale is just a mental abstraction uh, with a sole purpose at this time existing to promote evolution. Now, the, uh, this book, the, the Emperors Who Had No Clothes, is a book written um, by Milt Marcy, and he's a, a very a good historian. And the important thing about this book, where he talks about uh, uh, John Dewey and uh, Charles Darwin and Thomas Huxley and Charles Lyell and James Hutton, uh, he, those are the emperors. And what he shows is, is that these guys who uh, during this so-called enlightenment period brought all this idea of deep time into the, uh, uh, the world and into the church, that they didn't do this because they were scientists and because they were just trying to find the truth. They did this because they had a, they had a uh, thing where they were against the church. They wanted to uh, get the church out of education and bring uh, atheistic thought in instead. And they, were, they have been uh, primarily totally successful. So, so those, are the, those are the books that if you had those books and you read those books and studied those books, those are the only books you need, in my opinion. Uh, I know um, I have, a, you know, any, any author would get up and say his books are the best, uh, which, so you can expect that. But um, I, re I really think that, there, that if you are interested in creation science, you can get carried away with so many things and so many different directions that uh, people... Uh, send you that it's hard to, you know, settle on anything. And uh, so that's why I recommend these five books. So those books, uh, all you need to get a running head start, except there, there are two more things you need to do. Two more things. The first is develop a fervent love for the collaboration of God's general revelation, the creation, and his special revelation, the Bible. And assume that at this church I get the idea that that's already going on. 
Okay? And, and, and you need to adjust your attitude so that, you, that you're in every, every situation aware of the design of the universe where God has placed us. Uh, be conscious at all times of his providence. Consider the fact that every breath you take is dependent on the grace of God. Make every trip you make into the creation a time of worship. I hope many of you are already at that point. But if, if you're not, I believe you can make uh, the change in your heart to make that happen. So in Psalm 19, we have this, this discussion of the collaboration between God's general and special revelations where in the first part it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and then later on, the law of the Lord is perfect. And the second thing, besides uh, the, what I just said in the, in the books, is to visit as many natural history museums and zoos as you can. Ponder what you see in the exhibits, but ignore what you see in the interpretive signs, unless the museum happens to be uh, Bible-based, using Bible-based interpretations. In this uh, collage are some of the museums that I visited in my research, and uh, here are some more of the museums I've visited. Uh, I've also visited large zoos like the San Diego, the Los Angeles, the Oregon, the Louisville, and the Denver. And once you read the material in the five books uh, that I described and visit the museums and the zoos, you'll be able to come to your own conclusions about the truth. And if my experience is any indication, you will not see evolution in the creation or in the Bible, but will marvel at God's amazing work. If you use biblical presuppositions, you will come to the conclusions like the following. Now, this is Ken Ham. Many of you are aware of Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis. And this is a conclusion he likes to talk about. Is when, he's look, when he looks at the rock record, he sees billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And uh, that's something that I expect that you would find, too, if you uh, were to do that search. Next, I want to list some conclusions that I, that I came to after my 10 years of, of direct research. These are also listed in the book, Discovering the Animals of Ancient Oregon, and also there's some uh, free flyers on the table out there next to our book table, if you want to pick one up. Um, these are things that I think uh, are facts, and so let's read them. Number one, fossils are almost always formed by rapid and complete burial. Oops, going too fast here. Two, fossils are often found in assemblages, that is, fossil graveyards or bone jumbles. Fossil assemblages indicate catastrophe. And number four, fossils are found in regions all over the earth, even on mountaintops. Most, about 95% of the fossils of the world, are marine invertebrates. That means those are life forms without backbones. backbones. The geologic timeline and column uh, that's a mental abstraction, and it's not an observable reality. Number seven, the sedimentary layers of the geologic column have been correlated mostly by fossils. Number eight, measurable variation within a kind of life form can occur quite rapidly. Number nine, variation within a kind has not been and cannot be scientifically demonstrated to lead to evolution. That is, when I say evolution, I mean change from one kind to another kind, not variation within a kind. Number 10, variation within a kind can be quite extensive, but has def definite limits. Number 11, biogenesis, that is, life only comes from life, is a law of nature that has never been observed to fail. Number 12, all scientists, no matter their worldviews, observe exactly the same evidence. Number 13, true transitional fossils have not been found, and there is no scientific reason to believe they exist. Number 14, no life form found living or fossilized today is primitive or simple. Number 15, there is little evidence that fossils are now being formed in lake beds, rivers, or oceans. And number 16, the present is determined by the past and not vice versa. Uniformitarianism, that is the principle that states the present is the key to the past, that is an assumed principle of naturalism, not a scientific observation. 17. Fossil life forms are in many cases identical to or very similar to modern life forms. We call those living fossils. And finally, number 18. Ongoing variation within a kind often results in a reduction of future options for environmental adaptation for that kind. So if you, uh, I'd like to ask you to, to note that all 18 of those facts are harmonious with the biblical worldview of creation and a recent worldwide flood. 
Many of them are not in accord with evolution and millions of years. But today's topic is based on the John Day fossil beds, and uh, this book, Discovering the Animals of Ancient Oregon, is 282 pages. It's a hardcover text. I, I made it hardcover because I, I felt that uh, it would be a good book for uh, these Christian universities to use in their science classes. There are 141 photos and illustrations, and many of them are in color. Here is the um, picture. I'm having trouble with this thing. Okay, this is a picture uh, of uh, the state of Oregon, and you can see the outline of the state here. And the John Day fossil beds consist of three units. There's a unit right here that's called the Clarno unit. There's a unit here that's called the Painted Hills unit, and then there's a unit right here that's called the Sheep Rock Unit. Altogether, there's 14,000 acres, but there's a lot of land that's uh, around in them that uh, belongs to the uh, Bureau of Land Management. The uh, John Day Fossil Beds National Monument, of course, is a National Park Service uh, property. And there is some uh, private land as well, but most of the fossils that have, most of the fossil areas are within either the National Park Service or the BLM. Here's a photo of some of the fossiliferous badlands of the John Day fossil beds. And this is another view of the terrain there. This is a photo of uh, uh, Sheep Rock, which is near the uh, Thomas Condon Paleontology Center Museum. And so in the Discovering the Animals of Ancient Oregon, the, the first four chapters of the book, um, actually, the, yeah, the first four chapters, they focus on the history of the John Day fossil beds. The next three chapters are on the geology. Then there's a chapter on the general fossil fauna. And then there are 10 chapters on the major mammal fossils. And then there's a chapter on the Mitchell plesiosaur, and then a conclusion chapter. And there's an appendix with uh, 88 genus names and uh, a glossary and a full Thank you. Okay, now in, in this book, uh, you know, Discovering the Animals of Ancient Oregon, the first question that comes up, well, what do you mean by ancient? Well, that refers to life thousands of years ago, prior to the flood, not millions of years ago. And this is according to a straightforward interpretation of the Bible. I believe that the, uh, it's pretty clear that the John Day fossil beds are as a result of the worldwide flood. So the book, uh, the book is about the geology, the geography, and the paleontology of the John Day fossil beds, interpreted, as I said, according to the worldwide flood. And uh, the main historical characters in the book uh, are these guys who, who uh, brought the John Day fossil beds to the attention of the world. And the first one is Thomas Condon. Thomas Condon lived from 1822 to 1907, and I'm going to give you some more detail about him in a, in a little bit. The other guy is uh, Joseph Leedy. He lived from uh, 1823 to 1891. He was described as the last man who knew everything. <laughs> and uh, he is also thought to be America's first crime scene investigator, his first, the first CSI guy. He used his microscope to solve a crime. The next one is uh, Othniel Charles Marsh, O.C. Marsh. He lived from 1831 to 1899. And many of you may know that he's one of the combatants in the Bone Wars of the late 19th century. Um, Edward Drinker Cope. He lived from 1840 to 1897, and he was the other guy, the, uh, the other main combatant in the Bone Wars. And then the final guy uh, that uh, we're going to talk about is John C. Merriam. 
He lived from 1869 to 1945. And he's sort of the last of the major pioneer paleontologists to dig for fossils in the John Day fossil beds. He was a paleontologist from the University of California. And if you like history, I think you'll like the uh, first four chapters of Discovering the Animals of Ancient Oregon. So now we're going to go into this differing paradigm between what these four guys see and what uh, creation scientists see uh, so far as the evidence go. Um, it's sort of a fight between common ancestors over millions of years and a creator according to what he tells us. Uh, Genesis 125, we read, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. Well, Thomas Condon uh, was a Congregationalist pastor who first brought the fossils of the John Day area to the attention of the world. He was best known as Oregon's first geologist, but his main interest was in paleontology. And uh, here are the two books uh, that Thomas Condon relied on. He relied on The Principles of Geology by Lyell. That was a multi-volume book uh, put out by 1830 by Charles Lyell, the uniformitarian pusher. And then the other books were The Origin of Species and The Descent of Man by Darwin. Um, he just uh, loved to read those books and to quote from those books and other similar books. And uh, we all know that uh, Lyell is the one who got uh, the churches in large part to accept long ages, and Darwin's the one who got uh, the churches to accept evolution by the, according to natural selection. Well, unfortunately, Thomas Condon's major reference was not the Holy Bible. And uh, here are some of the things that sort of give you an idea of his foundational beliefs. In 1882, Thomas Condon said, Human beings have progressed from a lower order of existence like every other living thing. And uh, Condon could best be described, I think, as a theistic evolutionist. He believed that God somehow used atheistic evolutionary ideas to create over millions of years. He was one who rejected the Creator God that is revealed in the Bible. And uh, Conan used the word development for what we would today call evolution. He lectured and wrote about the development theory throughout the Pacific Northwest. And interestingly, in his 1902 book, The Two Islands and What Became of Them, uh, here are some things that Condon knew. This is the things that he wrote down in his book. And I'm going to show you how many of these things match up to the truth but it's just that his interpretation, because he had the wrong presuppositions, led him to the wrong conclusion. So he knew that the geological records are only preserved in the sediments of water, and, and that matches up to facts 1, 7, and 15 of those 18 facts I gave you. He knew that all the geologic periods of that time were correlated by seashell fossils, and that matches fact 7. He knew that fossils were often found in assemblages, that uh, matches up to facts 1 and 2. He knew that fossils were found on mountaintops, fact 4. He knew that ancient life indicated by the fossils was not at all simple, fact 14. And he knew that many fossil shells are indistinguishable from modern shells, fact 17. So even though he wrote these things in his book, he still concluded that uh, evolution and millions of years were true. Here's a quote from, uh, that uh, Thomas uh, Condon wrote in 1902. A minute and careful study of such rocky forms by some of the best minds of the present century has secured such results that students of geology may now speak with confidence of many great changes in the former life of the world. And then the, he wrote, the doctrine of theistic evolution, that is, the doctrine that declares evolution to be God's process of creation, is now taught by all of the higher colleges of our country. The emphasis is by me. Now, because it was taught, therefore, Condon believed it to be true. Like many today, Condon accepted the words of men, failed to apply critical thinking, and failed to believe what God had revealed in his word. Here's another quote. Reasoning a priori, we assume that organisms, both plant and animal, have been created by development from pre-existent forms because it agrees with the general course of nature. 
So, Kana knew that his belief was not scientific, but was taken on faith. He, like all evolutionists, never actually saw any evolution. He only assumed it a priori. And here's an, another quote, that the wise and good of the 19th century are about to let these doctrines of evolution and millions of years make atheists or even infidels of the, re, of the rising generation, I cannot believe. That they are necessarily destructive of faith, I believe is little. That the American church may, through their help, be able to cast aside a good deal of worthless teaching and rise to a higher plane of working power is far more legitimate to the signs of the times, unquote. So, Conan believed that plain teaching from the Bible was worthless. He was caught up in the so-called enlightenment of the time, an enlightenment that rejected the Creator God and His Word. So what is, uh, what's the legacy that Th Thomas Conan has? Well, he, at the University of Oregon, where he was a professor for a number of years uh, in his later life, there's a museum there, and in that museum they have, uh, of course, they want to they want to try to influence people that, well, since Thomas Condon was a pastor or a minister of some sort, that since he believed in uh, um, evolution and millions of years, that everyone should be able to. That, and, so, and they, so they quote him uh, saying that, I once believed God created a small fact. I now see he must have created a whole system of facts at once. But Condon's big th um, legacy is this multi-million dollar museum in the John D. Fossil Beds National Monument the Condon Paleontology Center. Uh, this picture uh, doesn't do justice to it. If you've been there, it, it is a pretty substantial museum and uh, you know, very, very good job of using our tax dollars to uh, give us uh, what I call the church at Sheep Rock. Now, it, um, it's a taxpayer-funded shrine to evolution of millions of years, named after Condon, and located next to Sheep Rock uh, in the Sheep Rock unit. When you walk into the uh, museum and then head toward the uh, area of the museum where they have all the fossils, you'll see this sign uh, that says the Thomas Condon Paleontology Center. And um, down at the bottom where I've got these yellow arrows pointing right here, we're going to read what it says down there. It says, again, evolution was simply God's method of working and therefore not atheistic or infidel. And then here's the story. The pioneer missionary as scientist. Thomas Conant believed that religion and modern science went hand in hand. He originally came to Oregon Territory in 1852 to spread the gospel after becoming a Protestant ministry minister in Michigan. But after investigating fossils in the John Day area, he de developed a scientific passion for paleontology. Conant believed science was a means to understand the spectacular nature of God's creation. Quote, the hills from which these evidences were taken, he wrote in pre reference to the evolutionary record of the fossil beds, were made by the same God who made the hills of Judea, and the evidences are as authoritative. The church has nothing to fear from the uncovering of truth. But now remember, in this sign, the words scientific and science really mean naturalism or materialism. And the truth he thought he uncovered actually covered the real truth of the Creator. And when you go into that museum and actually study all the exhibits in there in care, what you will find is that those exhibits reveal variants, variants within kinds. But there's absolutely no evidence for evolution from one kind to another kind. So in the book, um, there are 10 um, invertebrate animals that are studied uh, quite carefully. These are the dogs, cats, bears, tapirs, rhinoceri, horses, camels, oreodons, peccaries, and intelligence. Um, a complete chapter is devoted to each of those animals, and they're not all the mammals that uh, fra fossil fragments have been found in the area, but they're the major ones, and I chose to write on those 10 because those are the same animals that were chosen by Condon's daughter uh, by the name of Ellen Condon McCornack when she wrote a biography of her father. She wrote a biography, uh, um, you know, praising him as being uh, the greatest paleontologist in the history of uh, at that time. And uh, she chose these ten animals and then explained them through uh, evolution and millions of years. Now, we can, we can take a break now, if you'd like, or if you want me to just run on through, I'll do that. Keep going. Keep going, okay.
So next I'm going to give you a, f uh, a few chapter highlights in these uh, so that you can see a little bit about what I found and what I wrote about. Now when we, in chapter 9, it's about dogs. Now dog fossils have been discovered in the John Day fossil beds, but most of the vertebrate fossils discovered there are fragmentary parts such as teeth and skulls. The study of dog fossils provides us a good education regarding general variation within a kind. And in dogs, that is tremendous. There's a tremendous variation among dogs. And what you see in this slide is how all of these are dog skulls, and, uh, you, and every one of you would recognize each of those animals alive. You'd recognize them as dogs. But you can see all the variation uh, with regard to how their shape is formed and everything. All that's variation within the kind of a dog. When you look at cats, uh, we find that uh, there are lots of grandiose speculations that have been made by the secularists on these uh, cats with very little evidence. Extinct and living cats vary very little. They, they vary not hardly at all in their skeletal structure. So all the evolutionary speculations are based on skull and teeth variations. Sometimes fragments, uh, a fragment like this would be considered a great find and lots of speculations could be made about it. In the chapter on bears, we learn about plantigrade feet, and we learn that bears have plantigrade feet, humans, and among others, have plantigrade feet. And I, always, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, a study of tapers and their fossils reveals the fact that they've not changed much since they were created. Uh, evolutionists assume that they have a common ancestor somewhere way back when, but they have no idea what that could possibly be. On the rhinoceri, it's interesting that uh, these animals show a lot of variation uh, in their skulls prior to the flood. And there were even rhinos that had two horns on their snouts, like this one, instead of what we're used to seeing, just one. Many people believe that the evolution of the horse, which we look at in Chapter 14, was determined as fact in the 1800s by Marsh and Huxley. In the chapter on horses, you'll learn that not even evolutionists believe in straight-line evolution of horses anymore. And I'll bet you a few of you know that there are horses today, living today, that have more than one toe on each foot. Now, fossil evidence is in many cases so fragmentary that genus and species names are assigned based mostly on guesses. Now, we're looking at two skulls in this frame here that were extracted from animals in the same herd of 100 guanacos. A guanaco is a living species related to camels. Now, evolutionists often ascribe evolutionary stories to fossil fragments found with less variation than is exhibited here. So remember, these pictures are of two animals taken from the same herd. And uh, notice the variation between these two. Look at the difference up here. Look at the difference in their, their the way their upper teeth are. Uh, situated and how many they have and so forth. Uh, this, the back part of their skull is quite a bit different too. So this kind of thing causes all kinds of trouble for these paleontologists when they're trying to uh, come up with a story of which animal evolved from which animal and where whereabouts in this evolutionary story that they exist. Oreodons. The oreodons are thought to be extinct. I uh, have no reason to believe that they, that they aren't. And, uh, of course, there have been fossils uh, discovered in the John Day fossil beds. Oreodon means mountain tooth. And in my research, I determined that there were likely two created kinds of oreodonts. Um, interestingly enough, some of the oreodonts had toes on their feet like this, and some of them had hoofs. Under the peccaries, uh, one of the things in chapter 17 on peccaries is the story of, about how a peccary tooth was mistaken to be from a human ancestor. Perhaps you've heard of a Nebraska man. Fossil evidence from pre-flood peccaries indicate that they were not much different from those living today. What's a peccary? Uh, a peccary is uh, sort of like a little pig. I noticed that uh, Patrick has a uh, cast of one of these in his museum back there. I was going to ask him where he got that. 
the IntelliDunce have been described as pigs from hell and uh, envisioned as being as vicious as a T-Rex dinosaur. Much has been written about these animals, uh, that, and some uh, discovery in the John Day has been made, uh, based upon actually two very imperfect fossil skulls. A general statement that can be made about the vertebrate fossils in John Day is that there's been, never been discovered enough fossil material of, en of any one animal to reconstruct, any one animal kind to reconstruct a single complete skeleton. The reconstructions that are found when you when you read books about Oregon fossils and you see these see pictures of these animals uh, and say this is what the artist thinks they look like, most of that's based on uh, fossil material that was found in South Dakota, Nebraska, and other areas of the world. The fossil a lot of the fossil material from John Day is really fragmentary. In chapter 19, you will learn about the Mitchell plesiosaur, uh, not named after me. And you will see how major speculations and grand publicity is often based on very little evidence. So here's a photo of the fossil evidence upon which was based a town's historical basis for the secular worldview taught to their public school children. In other words, they used these pieces of tooth and jawbone here in order to devise a story for, for the uh, Mitchell school system whereby they were able to determine that this was a plesiosaur, that it lived millions of years ago, and exactly what it looked like, and all that sort of stuff. And then, of course, it gave great marketing for this little town. Uh, they have uh, uh, very little out in this neck of the woods, so anything that they can do to bring tourists is good for them. Uh, now, the fossil fragments for the Mitchell plesiosaur were found near the town of Mitchell in, or in this area, but uh, the uh, museum where, these, where the fossil evidence is located is in uh, the town of Fossil, Oregon. It's, and in, that, uh, they have the, uh, in this fossil, they have this metal sculpture and the story of the Mitchell plesiosaur. So here's a photo of the metal sculpture of the Mitchell plesiosaur at the Paleolands Museum in, in Fossil, Oregon. This sculpture was made by the high school students. In, in Mitchell, and here you see the sign that says, "The Mitchell plesiosaur, Cretaceous marine reptile, the tiger of the Cretaceous seas." Talks about who put it all together in 2009, uh, who the sculptor was, and so forth. And then, uh, if you read the uh, description of the animal, it says, "This 12-foot-long steel sculpture is a half-scale model of a plesiosaur." similar to the 20 to 25 foot long animal that died near the Mitchell, Oregon shoreline about 100 million years ago. Only a portion of the skull was found. This sculpture recreates the entire animal. This is an anatomically accurate model of a typical polycotylid plesiosaur based on the fossil discovered near Mitchell and similar fossils worldwide. And here's a close up of the snout of the thing. And just for reference, here's a photo of a plesiosaur uh, reconstruction at the Houston Museum of Natural Science, which is really sort of a beautiful thing, the way they did that. So, to discover my conclusions regarding the Mitchell plesiosaur, just take a look at chapter 19. Now, as you drive through the John Day fossil beds, you will see signs like this all along the way, throughout that area. It says, Journey Through Time, Oregon Scenic Byway. The intent of the state of Oregon is to indicate to the tourist that the time involved is millions and millions of years. And I trust my argument for uh, this evening is, is that you would see that I would disagree with that. I trust that uh, also that you would understand that the evidence is more likely to show a catastrophic flood event and then 4,500 years of geologic recovery. Yes, indeed, biblical paleontology is a powerful weapon against Satan and his lies. So here's a final reminder of the five creation science books that you can uh, use in conjunction with the Bible and your own research into God's revelations to assist your dive into the interesting study of biblical paleontology. Um, my wife Bonnie has those available back in, in the back of the room. One other thing I want to talk about is another resource is the online biblical paleontology course that is available from the Institute for Creation Science. Um, go to www.icspdx.org. 
Uh, I do have a number of these uh, booklets for free. They're on, uh, back there too. You can pick one up if you're interested. Uh, if you want, want to know more details about this course, or you can go to that website, icspdx.org. This is my website, my ministry website is creationengineeringconcepts.org, and there you'll find more creation science information. Also a weekly blog, the biblical interpretation uh, that I write weekly. I, I get somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 hits every month on that blog. And then you can also get creation science books and DVDs. So that's the uh, end of my presentation. Our, do we have time for some questions? Anybody have any questions? I have a question. Um, there's no complete uh, fossils, and the most they have is maybe a skull. That's like a really great find to get a whole skull, or do they even find whole skulls? In, in those fossil beds. Okay, the question is, is uh, with regard to the John Day fossil beds, um, how much of an animal is they found if they actually found any whole skulls? Uh, and yes, they, I, they have found some pretty much complete skulls, uh, but no uh, uh, real articulations of an animal, of an animal that's got all of its pieces. So most of the conclusions that these guys made and um, the, the paleontology that's been done since Merriam, John C. Merriam uh, left has been uh, pretty much uh, minimal. Uh, in other words, um, not a lot of new discoveries. If you go online, uh, the National Park Service, you can go online and you can look at their collections. There are thousands of fossils. Yeah, they, they've got pictures of them and you can look at them. The one, and, the, and the question would be, okay, if they really had some really grand specimens that they're hiding, why wouldn't they show them, you know? But there aren't, they're, they're just, the best thing that you can find are um, these, uh, like the upper half of a skull, perhaps, maybe. Now, uh, Thomas Condon, he found uh, dogs, a complete doll, dog head is what he called it, and he found other things, and he, he would send them off to these guys back east, and then he would never get them back. Uh, so uh, that didn't work out too well for him. And then what happened when uh, Marsh and, um, and Cope and Miriam, when they came to Oregon, uh, they took a lot of the stuff back east and just put it in drawers, and then some of it ended up in Germany because of the fact that uh, a, guy, a paleontologist there had taught... Uh, was a professor for Merriam when he learned his paleontology. So but does that mean that the, those uh, animals were torn apart before they were buried? Or that as they were buried, only a part of them was fossilized and the rest went away? Or does this indicate that this was a real torn up mass of flesh? Yeah, well, when... Uh, when I answer, the question is, what does that indicate? What, what are we finding when we find uh, these ripped up fossils? What's it indicate? And that's a very good question. Um, what I do when I look at fossil areas, geologic areas, I, I, I can't go back on a secular education in geology because I don't have one. So what I do is I go back and I say, oh, let's see, chapter 6, 7, 8, Genesis, uh, talks about this cataclysmic worldwide flood. And whenever I, when I walk throughout the John Day fossil beds, uh, I see what I would expect. And what I would expect is, is that in areas where you don't have uniformity of sediments, like in some parts of the, of the American continent, you can go for miles and miles and miles and, and identify exactly the same layer, can't you? I mean, those of you who have looked at that, you know you can see these layers for great areas. But in the John Day fossil beds, it's blip, 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 you know. And the only way that people know what, what particular age, quote, unquote, that things are is because of the fossils that have been found in them. 
Now, if you believe that there was a worldwide flood, why is it that you would that there would be a requirement for you to believe that in something as cataclysmic as that was, with the actions that we're that creation scientists are finding even in today, like at Mount St. Helens and uh, throughout uh, the entire wor- world, we're finding these things that are oh man, we never knew anything like that could happen. Why is it, if we believe there was a worldwide flood, would we believe that there should be some sort of uniformity over all these thousands of, of acres that we're looking at there? And I don't see the uniformity. The only way that they think that they can say, oh, this is the same age as that, is because of the fossils that are in them. But, you know, we don't know whether those fossils were formed right there or if they were brought in there. We know, for example, if when you look at a lot of the leaf fossils in the John Day fossil beds, that there are big piles of leaves, great big mountains of leaves, just fossilized leaves. And uh, the question comes is, why is there no tree? Why are there no branches? You know, it makes you think, I don't think that that probably is, is from something that occurred just at that location. It makes more sense that, that was a part of some sort of a, of a hydraulic, you know, bring it in and dropping it there. So I cannot answer your question, a great question. I cannot answer it with any great authority, but I would say that um, it, it's... It, along with other geologic, inform- other geologic and paleontological information that, that we've studied there in the John Day fossil beds, it, it looks like it, they, it happened because of the worldwide flood somehow. Now, the, the, a lot of the geologic information that uh, people uh, can give that help us understand it as part of the worldwide flood, even though not all creationists agree, but um, there are areas of pediments. If you're familiar with pediments are, uh, then you would know that that would be something that could not uh, come about other than by some large catastrophe. And also quartzite rocks that are believed to have uh, originated in the Rocky Mountains are throughout the area. Um, and, th- and there are others. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's lots of... Uh, of opportunity for additional research on that. Yes? Oh, so it's just a basic question. Can you talk about the, uh, the process for forming a fossil? Because there's no original bone left, right? I mean, that's long gone. It's a, some sort of chemical process or, or something. Okay, the question is, is can I explain the uh, process for forming a fossil? Um, Normally, what most people think of with regard to a, a bone fossil is a fossil that has been turned to rock, and that's a process called permineralization, where the, the, the fossil was rapidly, quickly buried, sort of like if you, can, if you could think of uh, something, a, a cement truck backing up to a, a dog and, or something, and maybe not your dog, and, and just uh, pouring a whole bunch of concrete on them, okay? Well, then over a, a period of time, depending on uh, the mineral content of, of the water and whatever else it runs through, you can get a replacement. You can get minerals replacing. But not all fossils are that. I mean, there, there are a lot of fossils that are not. I'm sure uh, Patrick has probably found fossils where they aren't even totally fossilized. And so... Uh, you know, there, there are lots of different uh, degrees of hardness. Some, like in, in my experience, uh, in Utah and Colorado, some of those places to dig a dinosaur bone out, you got to have jackhammers and picks. And it's really hard. It's just really hard. It's very difficult. But you go into the Glendive, Montana area where we've dug dinosaurs there, and, and the ground around it is quite soft. You can dig it with a spade, you know, with a shovel. You can dig the overburden off. And uh, so there's lots of variation from point to point, and there's variation within an area, too, as well. Some, so, uh, but I hope that gives you a, a general idea of, of what we're talking about when something turns to be like rock. It just gets the minerals replace the original organic material. Yes. Kind of off topic, but not really, is, is uh, the thing that gets me really, that insults my intelligence, is they're on Mars, they find a canyon like eight times the size of the Grand Canyon, and it had to be formed by water. If there's no water on Mars. You've got Earth, 76% covered in water, the Grand Canyon was a little triple that kind of carved it through. That insults my intelligence. I mean, 
it, it's crazy. And, and you know, some of the things you said they they were uh, thrown over to their uh, uh, you know lines and stuff like that. That of all the things that I just heard it recently, you know, it, it boggles the mind. Yeah, did everyone hear that example? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Well. Um, of course, that's that's uh, and you you feel that way because you have a different set of presuppositions. Now, remember, when I would not have thought that I was an idiot when I was 39 or 40, but it was re because I had an entirely different set of presuppositions. I knew I had been told by all the guys in the lab coats and all the guys with the PhDs this, that, and the other thing. And of course, what are you supposed to do when you go to class? You're supposed to learn what they tell you, right? And so that's what happens, and that's why it's so important for us to uh, to on our own do our own search. Now, the thing the thing that I tell other people about biblical paleontology is is that the evidence is fairly readily available because of all the uh, natural history museums and uh, you know all the books have been written and everything now if you're going to try to get into molecular biology now you got a problem because you have to you have to uh, have the ability to run electron microscopes and all, because if you're going to do it on your own right because the, on the one hand they're say, they're saying oh yeah Intelligent design; those people are crazy, you know. On the other, other hand, they're saying, "Well, look, this is an obviously intelligent design," and uh, the creationists say, "Well, and we know who the creator was, or who the designer was." So, just presuppositions, and people, and people who are not willing to examine their presuppositions are uh, bound to get into trouble. You, know, you need to, you need to understand, you know. And we're in a good position because we were not there at the time that this happened. Neither were the secularists, but we know someone who was there, and he wrote and told us what happened. So we we have that example, uh, that big advantage. Was there one over here? Yes. Early on in the talk, you noted that the preponderance of fossils, 95 percent, are marine critters. You pretty much discussed land critters. Is that a peculiarity of the John Day fossils, or is that just a selection effect that uh, Kanye started with and nobody's gotten around? The question is, is uh, uh, I had given the fact that 95% of fossils approximately that have been discovered are uh, marine invertebrates. Uh, and uh, then I went ahead and I write books about everything else but, right? So that's the question. Why do you do that? Um, well, uh, I do that because uh, they're interesting. And... Uh, the, the other things are not so interesting to most people. It's sort of like dinosaurs, if, uh, if it, it, almost every child is interested in dinosaurs, but very few of them are interested in, in fossil clams, you know. But to answer your question directly, yes, uh, most of the fossil correlations in the John Day fossil beds are, are by ammonites or uh, various bivalves. That's how they determine how old the area is. It's not by these mammal fossils particularly, because the mammal fossils, <laughs> when you get to reading the literature, what you find out is, is that they're all in the wrong places, you know. That they're, they should be here, but they're here, or no, maybe they're down here. So the more they dig and everything, the more mixed up it becomes. And so, oh well, we'll just use we'll just use the fossils that were originally found back by um, Marsh and and these guys. They're the ones that determine how old these different sediments are. We'll just stick with it, and then we'll take our geologic time line uh, and we'll set that right over the top of it. And now everybody knows how old all these areas are. And then the radiometric dating and all that comes in later, and it has to match up. Remember, radiometric dating uh, came in long after the uh, geologic time scale and geologic uh, column, quote unquote, was established. That was established uh, by Lyell in large part based on fossils in England and in Europe. And if you read uh, Rocks Aren't Clocks by uh, John K. Reed, he explains all that very clearly as to how it's all just a bunch of smoke and mirrors, you know, just basically it has to, they have to keep it that way in order to justify evolution as being a fact and, you know, in the back. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your lecture, but do you see similarities in uh, Drumheller 
looking at the uh, black hills formation where you find the orthodons and all, a lot of the you see mammals. And with John Day, you see pyroclastic flows, microsexual flows. You see rapid depositions that acknowledge, or do you see if you've been in those places? A similarity in rapid deposition, whether it's volcanic or yeah, the question. Uh, yeah, the question is, is if uh, see similarity in these different. He he spoke about Drumheller, which is up in Alberta, Canada. Uh, also, uh, talking about uh, you know like South Dakota, and Nebraska, and and well, what what the similarity is at first glance is is that um, the first similarity you usually notice in these high fossiliferous areas, where you have the the big bones like dinosaurs or mammals is is that uh, they're found in badlands and you can, and so you can say well that what's that tell you well one thing it tells you is it's hard to find fossils that are buried by Douglas fir forests um, I mean you, it's you you find fossils where they are and where they are is where they come popping out so when I, when you're looking I'm sure Patrick would know better than most of us about how did you you go along looking on the ground here and then you find a piece and then you look up and then that's where you are likely to find a good fossil because it, the erosion takes it out and if the, if the material is uh, covered with vegetation then you don't you, you know the fossils are hard to find unless somebody digs them up with a backhoe or something um, but um, so far as direct correlation between uh, say Drumheller and John Day I don't think there is any um, because that that is a part of a system that goes down in, you know, starts up in Canada and goes down through North America. You can one of those places where you see a lot of consistency of the sediments, and the, you don't have that uh, that same geology in uh, John Day fossil beds. What I'm asking is in the uh, Aquila and uh, formations that you get a big hill. You've got about twelve mammals that are County culture is huge, 250 foot uh, polystyrene trees. And so I'm thinking, is there a similarity with some kind of volcanism that, that you get <coughs> this huge, uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm overstating this, uh, volcanic flows or, or kind of a similarity in rapid transition <coughs> from Alberta clear down to the Dakotas, John Day. Um, well, I think Patrick could answer that question better than I could, uh, because I, I'm, I'm, um, you know, not a geologist, and and what I find in some cases is the more degrees that a geologist has, the worse his perspective is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, when I one interesting fact I learned was. Back in the 18, early 1800s, uh, you know, it's, it's important, the correlation is important to geologists. You know, whether it's, whether it's from a practical standpoint of find, finding fossil fuels, you know, or uh, some sort of ore or something, correlation is important. In other words, it, they want to be able to find the same sort of thing here and over here because if they found a bunch of valuable stuff here, then maybe they can know they'll find it over here, right? So correlation is important. So back in the 1800s, with regard to correlation, at first they thought that looking at these uh, uh, materials, the fossils and the, and the sediments and so forth in England, they thought that if they found the same thing in America, well then it, they could know that it was exactly the same age. Well, the first thing they found is that, oh, it doesn't work to use the same sediments like the same color of the same of sandstone that doesn't work how do they know it doesn't work well because the fossils don't match up the other next thing they found was it doesn't work to have the same thicknesses of sediments in one place and another to correlate and like in, in some places they they would have 10,000 feet of something and then go to another location they have 500 feet and they say that doesn't match up. How do they know it doesn't match up? Because the fossils don't match up. So the fossils always win. If, it's, if you're doing radiometric dating or if you're doing any other kind of correlation, 
fossils always win. And so that's what I'm talking about. Fossils and, and deep time are, are two different sides of the same coin. They support each other. And if, and one, if one goes away, then the other one will go away because they're tied together. South Bellevue, and when they uh, rebuilt my son's school, Somerset, if I know where that is, he came home with these rocks full of seashells. Where'd you get those? Well, they're digging up our school. So, so on the top of Somerset Hill, must have been ocean at some time, uh, he's digging these clam fossils. About five miles away is, is where the coal beds are for, for Newport and, and Newport Hills. And uh, again, the other side of Somerset, you could find giant uh, tree trunks, if you know where to look, by hiking the, the Red Town Trailhead, just, just all over that hillside. There's fossils all over the place. Of course, I suspect they don't let you take them, but, but they're there. It's kind of fascinating. And within five miles, you've got something that's nothing but shells. And then uh, where the coal seams are, there's all kinds of uh, tree trunks and parts of trees. It's just fascinating. Well, Heinz um, would like me to mention to you that tomorrow night I'll be speaking at the uh, Snohomish uh, um, Apologetics Forum, and my topic is going to be polystrate fossils and petrified forests. So um, that, that might be of interest to you. Yeah, I don't know anything specifically about what you're talking about there, but um, it, it uh, is amazing that uh, how many of these invertebrate fossils we can find everywhere and anywhere, even on the tops of mountains. They found them, uh, found fossil on uh, Mount Everest even, on the top of Mount Everest. So we, we know that at one time something was different, you know, than what it is now. And, and the expl our explanation of a catastrophic worldwide flood and then the description of the various theories that creation scientists have as to how um, what happened was that the land lifted up and then the sea basins dropped down and that's where the water went and as you mentioned uh, we got a lot of water here on earth and no water on Mars but those who have the wrong presuppositions can only see uh, catastrophic water conditions on Mars and they can't see it here on earth because of their presuppositions yes Well, the, I don't have to guess. She wants to know how they're going to explain away the uh, the original soft tissue that they're finding in various animals, such as the T. Rex. Um, I don't have to guess. I don't have to assume because they're already doing it, and uh, they they are just uh, basically because their their faith and their presuppositions, you know. Uh, is such that they can only see 65 million years, then they have to assume that they don't understand the fossilization process. They've got to find a fossilization process that will preserve soft tissue for 65 million years. And so, um, you know, and how is it that you would prove that? Uh, you, the only way I can see you could prove it is if you could last for 65 million years, you know. Not likely that's going to happen, so it's just going to be uh, a bunch of bluster, you know. Um, so it, it, that is a very strong evidence for, you know, a 4,500 year ago worldwide flood. Uh, is, and it's not just, they're not just finding it in dinosaurs, they're finding it in a lot of other animals and so forth. So. In, in the movie of adaptation of or in the, in the most recent, uh, not the one coming out, but the most recent, uh, up till now, the Hobbit movie uh, where Bilbo Baggins confronts the dragon. Doesn't the dragon look an awful lot like the dinosaur? Well, I, I haven't seen all of those, but I will say this is that uh, uh, it, most uh, dragons look a lot like dinosaurs. And, uh, you know, there, there's a strong reason to believe that dinosaurs existed until maybe uh, 500 years ago. They were pretty common or, you know, common enough that people in an area knew about them, knew to stay away from them. And, and uh, so the 
dragon slayers would go out and get them, and eventually they got them all. You know, they're, that's what happened to them. So, yeah, I, I can imagine that the that the dragon would look like a dinosaur because most of the depictions I've seen where they've been painted in the past uh, look like dinosaurs. Yes. Uh, here in Washington, we like to talk a lot about the Lake Missoula flood. Do you have any comments to make on Lake Bonneville flood and how it might have impacted the John Day or Eastern Oregon area? Um, yeah, I can talk about the uh, Missoula flood. How about the Lake Bonneville? You're talking about the, for the Grand Canyon, you mean? or what, what you're... Well, and how it probably some might say possibly, swept across eastern Oregon and how that might have influenced the geography of eastern, Washington, of eastern Oregon. Well, I, I can't answer that part of the question, but I can answer you that there's no indication that the Missoula flood hit this section of Oregon. It, it went across eastern Washington and down through the Columbia Gorge and then down into the Willamette Valley uh, and up north a ways, but it did not, uh, there was, the elevation was too high for it to uh, have any a impact on the central Oregon. Um, and I, and I, don't, I don't see any indication of uh, glaciers in that area. There, there's, in eastern Oregon there are indications of, of ice being there, but I don't think they're from the ice age from where the uh, ice came down from the north, you know. Uh, I think I think that that uh, there's there's uh, and, and uh, I would quote uh, Michael Ord and Vardaman and some of those guys who have studied that and they they would say that the ice sheet stopped short of uh, the John Day area, John Day fossil beds area. Is there any record of uh, evolutionists coming to the Lord? Um, well, there are probably two different ways you can look at that. Um, I know of a lot of engineers and, and uh, other technically trained people like physicians and so forth who went through the education like I did and were uh, not didn't have an opportunity to know there was another side and once they saw the evidence then they uh, did the same thing I did they were converted so there's a lot of evidence for that uh, and there are a lot of people who start out uh, you know whether whatever whether they are a technical field or not and do the same thing because they're analytical thinkers a lot of people don't it's not worthy of thinking about they make their decisions so what I call emotionally they're emotional Christians for example rather than analytical Christians um, but of course there the thing that you have is if if you're talking about PhDs occasionally for example one of the guys who had a theory for the origin of life from chemical processes uh, I've forgotten his name right now, but he 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 converted. Yeah, Kenyon. Yeah, he converted. Uh, he he finally saw the light once once he saw the mechanisms of, of how complex uh, the cell was and how it worked. Then um, then that's what happened. But here's here's the situation that you have. If you spent your most PhDs have uh, approximately oh you got you go 12 years in high school four or five more years to get your bachelor's degree and then a couple more for a master's and then maybe four more after that and then during all that time they're working their tails off to get established and so they have to bow down to whoever they're doing their work for and they also have to start publishing if they and so once they get their PhD if, if they don't publish then they're lo they're not going to get any income, so they have to publish, and in, and it has to match up to the peer review. Well, if the peer review is secularism, which all peer review is basically secularly based, then even being a Darwin doubter is going to be a big threat to your career. Um, I know I talked to uh, 
uh, John Horner, Jack Horner, who's a dinosaur guy behind the Jurassic movies. You know, he was the uh, guy who who uh, was their advisor for the Jurassic movies, and he's also the um, uh, paleontologist at the at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. I talked to him, and I said. Uh, you know, you're not even looking at this evidence. You're not, and he said, J.D., don't you know that science is not about truth? And I was flabbergasted. But you, you see that a lot of them really know, but they don't, they don't dare step outside because they still have to put food on the table and they still have uh, a tremendous investment in uh, their hubris, you know, in uh, uh, their, uh, their fame or their notoriety in their, ex in their expertise. And it's hard to let that go, you know. It's hard. All of us probably have, you know. I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for myself. That at times you get, you get a little too much of yourself, you know. And these guys have got a lot of theirself, and the, and it's. And uh, Dr. Um, Jerry Bergman has written a book called *The Slaughter of the Dissidents*. Uh, and if you're interested in that sort of thing, as to how how come it is that you don't find a lot of uh, scientists coming out and once they know the facts and converting to Christianity or, or at least uh, to uh, a belief in the Bible, biblical Christianity, then uh, you'll see why it is. In the slaughter of the dissidents, he doesn't just talk about Christians who are, who are uh, you know, put at great risk. He talks about dar all you have to be is a Darwin doubter, just... I don't see any any evidence. Uh, just say I don't see any evidence for Darwinian evolution, which there is none. You know, and uh, you're in trouble. You may not get. Uh, you know, you may not get uh, the next job. You may not uh, get tenure, and so on. Yes. Uh, probably the best example of that is in the book that just came out, uh, "Evolution's Achilles Heel," written by nine scientists from CMI and also you know, some ICR scientists. Many of those authors actually believed in evolution in their early days, and they changed their view once they saw the evidence. They wrote this book and the DVD that's available just now. Yeah, there, there are other books, too, um, where the creationists have put out. That ha uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but one that's, uh, that uh, has about a, uh, maybe 20 uh, scientists who have written that they believe in the six-day creation and young earth and so forth. No, it's called In Six Days. It's the fifth scientist. This guy's my uh, uh, library man here. <laughs> That's right. There's another great example of this. John Sanford, who writes the book Genetic Entropy, who was at Cornell for his career getting near retirement. He could afford to uh, take the covers off and, and uh, come out. And he did, and of course, he, he cites a lot of, of, of friends. And there are several books, I think they're by Answers in Genesis 50, <coughs> who uh, have become creationists. So that if she really looked, looking for them, Googling, yeah, it's, it's very helpful if you have, if you're to the point in your career where you don't need to have a job. You know. <laughs> okay. Any others? All right. Well, I thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak to you, and hopefully, I helped you with some answers.